I'm here to talk to you about infographics. So um, uh, a little overview of what I'm going to cover. I'm going to start with a little bit about me. Then I'm going to go through a very brisk history of infographics and how we've got to where we are now. Uh, then I'm going to use this axis of info I've created to uh, think a bit more uh, critically about the different types of infographics and categories. Uh, and then go through a few examples and things that, in my opinion, are good and uh, successful uh, for fundraising and campaigning specifically. Um, and then a recap. So to talk a little bit about me, I have been uh, a graphic designer, been freelance for about six years. And I, uh, I work in northeast London uh, and starting to expand Slowly, it's now me and my assistant uh, taking on the world. And um, the work I do uh, broadly fits into two categories, one being community engagement and the other one being more environmental and conservation focused. And within those two broad realms, um, uh, my main design outputs tend to be branding and website design, uh, also a bit of Handmade, hand painted nature reserve signage, a lot of wood, a lot of varnish, a lot of emergency varnishing. Uh, and then uh, the third uh, is infographics, which is why I'm here. So, to give you a few examples, infographics wise, first thing is the Information is Beautiful book. Those of you into infographics might be familiar with it. I helped out um, along with some other designers to do a few spreads. This particular spread is about consciousness and is a visualization of a few different thinkings about how consciousness works. More recently, uh, I've been doing work for Oxfam. Uh, this is one about tax evasion, and this other one is about the Scottish economy. This one was one overall infographic, um, containing lots of different types of information and telling the whole story. And then uh, we also broke that down into individual um, graphics, such as unemployment and lost money, uh, which were then used separately throughout a report. Um, and this main one went online. I've also thrown in here a diagrammatical graphic from a Zero Carbon Hub to do with saving energy and saving the world. Um, uh, I've also done a few things recently for 350.org and the World Development Movement. Uh, and then uh, this one, just to mention briefly, is the Transformational Index. Uh, some of you might have met Andy Schofield yesterday, who did a session on measurement. Uh, so I'm part of the TI team and have been developing the infographic, the use of infographics um, with them and, and their tool. Uh, and so far, we've done, I think, over 40 is the count so far, which was a nice number to uh, discover. Uh, and this is just a couple of examples of how those played out um, and telling the story and um, uh, the particular organization's um, measurement strategy and whatnot. Um, so that's probably enough about me. So to dive into a rather brisk history, um, infographics have been with us in one form or another for a very long time. So I'm starting with a really long time ago um, with uh, cave paintings and uh, hieroglyphics and other things from the ancient world. Uh, this um, cave painting from Turkey from 6600 BC is thought to be a representation of the local town and a volcano eruption. And it's debated, we're never really gonna know, but if that is what it is, then that's a very early example of data visualization. Moving through to modern foundations quite a long time ago. Uh, this is kind of uh, 1700s, 1800s. This one is um, a poster from eight, 1788 um, campaigning for uh, conditions on slave ships. And I think this is uh, cited as one of the earliest, if not the earliest uh, example of a social justice campaign using infographics. And they've, uh, on this poster, they've mapped out just the, the spatial arrangement of people. Uh, and they use this, I think they've printed 7,000 copies and plastered them all around the place. And 
uh, Parliament um, passed an act to limit the amount of people that were allowed on the ships. So success. Uh, and I've just dropped in here because I thought this was fascinating, a modern representation of uh, how people were packed onto the ship, which is fascinating but grim. So back to our timeline. This guy, William Playfair, is um, acknowledged as inventing bar graphs and pie charts, which were fairly controversial at the time, um, but have since become <coughs> commonplace. Uh, I do actually have Playfairs in my family, in my heritage. My grandparents are Playfairs, which bodes well for, you know, for graphics being in my genes. However, I think that this particular Playfair was a bit of a crook and might have done some bad things. So I'm not sure, that, you know, not sure how much heritage I want to claim from that. Um, and again, from the 1800s, Florence Nightingale's quite famous example of her campaigning for uh, sanitary conditions in military hospitals. Uh, she has her own version uh, of the pie chart, which comes under many names, including the Nightingale Rose, which I think is the nicest name. So again, a, another kind of social good bent use of infographics. Then we come to recent history. On the left is a capitalist pyramid. Interesting example. Might be familiar or other versions of it. But what I really want to talk about is isotype which was a pictorial uh, system invented in the 30s by Otto and Marie Neurath in Vienna. Uh, and they wanted to tell Vienna about itself as a city. And so they devised this system of icons uh, to talk about technology and population uh, and other factors. And this nice little one here, let's make it big, is about the life cycle of animals and you can see the different animals have different color codes and uh, yeah, that just runs through to the length of time. It's particularly one of my faves. So that kind of set the groundwork for what we have now, right now, um, where infographics have become ubiquitous, we're flooded with them, they're everywhere. Most people, if they don't know what the term means, if you show them what it is, they'll be, they'll, you know, um, they'll be familiar to the point where it's become coffee table worthy. So here's the information, beautiful book again, plug, plug. Uh, and it's become a, a visual language that people are familiar with um, to the point where now, such as this example, is infographics which actually don't have data in. They're more an illustration. It's kind of gone beyond what uh, people think of as what an infographic should be. And there's a lot of uh, satirizing uh, satirizing themselves and infographics about infographics. In fact, there are probably more infographics about infographics than anything else. This one I like with uh, the amount of Twitter links to infographics increasing and his interest decreasing. Um, so this kind of realm of um, infographic fatigue in general means that if we're going to create an infographic now, it's got to be something a bit special to stand out from everything else that's flooding, um, flooding people's attention. So let's move over to, to my axis of info, which I've created. So this um, I thought would be a good way to try and uh, structure the different categories of infographics uh, and to be able to kind of compare what different ones are like and what they do and what they're good for. So uh, my uh, horizontal axis is about um, how the data is visually translated. So on one side we've got a data bomb which is just data thrown on a page without, without much visual consideration and at the other end we've got a pretty picture where the data has taken such a back seat that it may no longer have a seat. And then uh, running from top to bottom is the amount of data in the infographic. So ranging from uh, pure data, lots of data, all the way through to no data, but interpretation and message and narrative. So there's kind of sliding scale there. So that might be a bit confusing but hopefully not for long because I've plotted some infographics on um, 
on this chart to try and explain where things are. So um, down in this bottom corner, we have something that's between a data form and a pure data graphic um, showing a whole lot of data in one place, uh, not immediately obvious what it's about. I'm sure there's a lot going on there, but it's difficult to kind of pull out. Down at the bottom here, somewhere between a pretty picture and pure data, there's um, this one on the right is about cheese. We've got all our different cheeses around the wheel of cheese. Uh, and then it separates them all down into their origins and the particular type of milk they came from. Uh, and similarly with the anatomy of a cupcake on the left, apologies for the poor resolution, we've got all the different uh, elements that come together to make a cupcake. These are data rich, They've, they're, they're telling information and quantities and um, how things relate to each other, but there's no message behind it, it's not trying to tell you anything, it's not trying to make you um, think anything in particular. And up here in the top left corner, between pretty picture and woolly interpretation, is this map of Italy, which uh, looks at the characteristics, regional characteristics, um, which at first glance maybe looks like it might be uh, data, but uh, with kind of fashion uh, over Milan and pollution down south, it's more, um, more opinion driven. Um, and then up here, we have this graphic about Syria, which uses the uh, infographic language with its strong typography, its uh, long format, but uh, it, uh, each of the statements it makes aren't backed up with statistics, so it's actually more opinion-based. And then the final one is marked somewhere more around the center, which is this violence against women. Uh, infographic, which has more of a balance of data and story and, uh, and design with uh, kind of relevant imagery depicted and quite a strong uh, design style. So I do a little overview of that. That's how they all sit. And then the third uh, look at this axis is um, more kind of pinpointing where things uh, kind of belong. So I've put campaigning and fundraising at the centre <coughs> because I think it's this, the balance between the amount of data you're showing and the, the, the story and the message that you're trying to portray uh, along with having quite a strong uh, <coughs> design uh, direction and using uh, kind of uh, icons and whatnot that make a successful infographic for that context. Other contexts uh, other infographics work well for, so for a scientific journal, it's more relevant to have more information um, with less of a visual translation on. And annual reports, they don't want any interpretation on, we just want to show what's happening, but probably in a slightly attractive fashion, as attractive as we can. Uh, and then uh, in the red are a few kind of danger spots for campaigning and fundraising infographics. There is the million dollar background image, which looks very nice, uh, but it doesn't have much data in it to back it up. There's the trophy wife, which also looks very nice, but it doesn't have much message to convey. Down at the bottom, we've got the Where's Wally infographic, where you uh, have to uh, survey quite a complicated terrain, visual terrain, and it's difficult to find the information that you want. And then the magic eye, where again, visually complicated, and you might never understand what it is you're meant to be looking at. So on to the good, the bad, but no ugly, no place for ugly here. Um, and these, this grouping on the left, I've picked out. There's obviously a lot of amazing infographics, and I've just picked out a few that, are, that have something interesting about them or something to talk about. But obviously there are thousands of other ones, other examples. These, um, so these ones all have uh, a cause and uh, some kind of message that they're trying to convey. Um, so these are more directly relevant to us in terms of campaigning and fundraising. These three on the left are all long format, um, a fairly familiar format for infographics um, placed within websites, mainly just to give more room and to uh, harness uh, people's uh, wanting to, to scroll. I think that there's still a bit of a, 
uh, a bit of a thing about the fold on a web page and wanting things to be before the fold. But really, the fold doesn't exist anymore, especially over all the different uh, tablets and phones and other mediums people use to look at websites. So using these long formats is really uh, using people's intuitive uh, way they use websites and scroll around. So it kind of works with people. These three I like because they've all got quite a strong visual style. They all have uh, a strong title, which introduces, um, introduces the topic. And they all use visual um, techniques to lead the viewer down through the different data. And they all involve um, some statements and points that they want to get across, followed by statistics that back them up. So it's quite a, quite a nice flow. Um, at the bottom, these two, uh, they mention their references. And I think that's really interesting because you don't always see it, but thinking back to this uh, horizon of infographic fatigue and wanting to stand out as being uh, something engaging and authentic um, by showing sources and proving that your data is robust, uh, I think that's a, a quite an interesting way of standing out. Um, up here, I have a couple of nice map examples. This one at the top um, is actually physically made out of sponge. And the theme about uh, urban domestic water use and, what, is, and what, they've, uh, what they've taken from that is the use of sponge and applying water to the sponge in uh, the correct ratio of how those countries, the amount of water those countries use, uh, which gives quite a nice... Uh, textural representation of the comparison between the different countries. Quite clean and simple. This world map uh, kind of challenges our perception of what the map should look like. Uh, and Save the Children have removed countries um, that don't have a ban on corporal punishment of children to create this new map, which feels wrong but fits in the same visual style that you would expect to see a map in. So it's kind of that double take. Which, um, is exciting. What have we got up here? This uh, example is from Cambridge. And I think there's uh, the, the blurb, although I haven't been to Cambridge and, and seen this, but there's uh, meant to be kind of a two, two sides of the track. And there's one, uh, one side that people don't go to so much. And so this, uh, this infographic kind of project, people will go into the shops on the wrong side of the track and then uh, they'd have all these buttons they could press to vote on different aspects of the shops. And then they physically went out and sprayed them onto the pavement in front to kind of show how people felt about these shops um, and engaging with the public uh, to encourage people to go in and to think differently about the area. So that's kind of an exciting real, real life format. This one at the end is um, uh, more of a traditional journalistic style of infographic. Um, appropriate for journalism in that it covers quite a lot of data and uh, spreads it out in uh, an effective layout. It's got good elements of scale so that it's not kind of all in your face at once. And you do have to work a bit harder to understand what's going on, uh, but you're kind of rewarded by all the learning you do by getting to the end. There's also, I mean, you can look at this, and I think this might be in Italian, but you understand what it's about immediately through their, their use of imagery. So over on this side, under my other visually engaging thoughts section, are other infographics which might not be completely successful for campaigning and fundraising, but they have something interesting about them. It's nice to think a bit more broadly about what infographics can be, what um, techniques we, there are to use. This one at the top is uh, real. It's, it's people. It's uh, yeah. It's uh, exciting because it's not you know flat on the page. It's people moving around and interacting. These two down here are quite fun. Uh, this infographic about tattoos in the style of a tattoo. I don't know, it's quite simple, but it's quite nice. And this one on the bottom um, about manufacturing, uh, also quite, quite tangible, quite uh, representative of what it's talking about immediately. 
so quite simple. This long one uh, I have a fondness for. It's a watercolour painting uh, which just talks about fish and the different types of fish that live at different levels in the sea. And as you go down, uh, you learn about which fish exist. Um, but it's just nice to see something that's not, uh, not just a vector silhouette kind of iconography based style, but something a bit more, a bit more textural made that stand out for me. This one is a really interesting example because I think visually it's very engaging as soon as you see it. Uh, it's something a bit different in terms of how the bar graph works um, and very kind of simple in its, uh, its setup. Oh, there's something about this particular set of, of graphics there's some other ones in the series where there's something a bit funny going on with uh, the fact that that's 55% on the end, whereas he's completely covered up, which for me would say that should be 100%. So there's something a little bit disconnected there. Um, but worth thinking about. Oh, there's some nice color palettes. Um, this is a nice uh, handmade infographic about different blood types um, arranged into a lovely poster still getting across its message. Some more physical displaying um, and some use of real life objects to really tap into people. Um, on, uh, on the use of um, uh, human recognizable objects, there has been some research done in terms of infographics, uh, thinking about how to make them most memorable. Um, and uh, on looking at Images of things that people recognize compared to bar graphs and pie charts. Apparently, uh, it's more memorable if it's something that people can relate to and recognize, uh, which is kind of an interesting bit of information. This is hilarious. People fill out this form with their coffee. It's all about coffee. Um, what else do I want to say? Oh, I want to say something about context. So this one, maybe in particular, um, it's important to think about your context and how, um, how uh, your audience are going to see the infographic, but it's also worth thinking about what happens when it's taken out of its context, when somebody copy and pastes it off a website and shoves it into a presentation, uh, and how that works on its own uh, when it's removed from where you initially decided it was going to be seen. Does it still retain, retain everything? This is just kind of stuff to bear in mind. I think it's kind of the core aspects of making successful infographics about what you're trying to say and your audience um, and making sure you facilitate um, what you want people to actually do, whether it is sharing it or um, clicking on something or giving some money or whatnot. Um, and I was also going to mention briefly a few things that um, uh, I think are good uh, when working with a designer to create infographics. I know I've got five things. I'm trying to remember what those five are. Uh, I think one of them is about um, having, the, uh, having the designer uh, earlier in the process um, to be able to understand the data and to really think about concepts and message before stylistic um, decisions are made and really driving it from the data and the concept rather than jumping in too early um, talking about we want pictures of elephants, we want things popping and bouncing, but to more have, have it being led from the data. Uh, also, to... This is why I've got notes. Here we go. Working with the client, basically. If there's the opportunity to be flexible with what data there is to use, um, hopefully uh, uh, more data to be able to pick from what's going to work together um, and what's going to work visually. Um, it's nice to be involved in that process. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Here's my further reading. These are two particularly lovely books that um, have helped me put together this talk, particularly visualizing information on advocacy. It's a superb book. I'm a, I'm, I don't actually work for them. You, you wouldn't know it, though. Um, yeah. And there we go. That's the end.